Hello, all you girls and boys, and listeners near and far. Uh, we're sorry for the background noise. We're in a theatre bar. Um, we're here to talk. We're here at the Barbican Theatre Bar um, to talk about the great art of pantomime, British pantomime. This is um, not necessarily what Americans would call pantomime. Um, so we don't mean someone pretending to be trapped in a glass box, and we don't necessarily mean someone walking against the wind either in Marcel Marceau style. What we do mean instead is the great British tradition of pantomime, which is well. Thos and I have a bit of personal experience of this. We write pantomimes, or have written pantomimes in the past. And Thos, tell us about the basic tropes of the pantomime. Well, the essential thing in the first place is the story, and that would usually be a nursery rhyme or a fairy tale. Um, The most common ones being Dick Whittington and his cat, Cinderella, um, Aladdin, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Some of the rarer ones are Puss in Boots, Mother Goose, um, Sinbad the Sailor, and occasionally Peter Pan, who's one of the very few stories which has come into the canon recently. And so that's the story... Um, and the one we're here to see today, of course, the one you didn't mention, which is Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, I wanted it to be a surprise. <laughs> well, I've now revealed the surprise. We'll be talking a little bit later to George Styles and Anthony Drew, who we've spoken to before, but we'll be talking to them specifically about this pantomime, Jack and the Beanstalk, for which they've written the score and for which Jonathan Harvey has written the book. Um, we'll also be talking a little bit later to Jonathan Cohen, to Adele Anderson, and we'll be hearing from new presenter Becky Applin. And in between that, we'll be here in the foyer of the Barbican, discussing some of the essential ingredients you need for a family pantomime, um, which is seasonal. It usually happens at, well, almost invariably happens at uh, the Christmas period. And the New Year. And in the New Year as well, yeah. So depending on whether you're middle class or not. So one of the first things we need to talk about, well, we'll talk about the the music a little bit later, and we'll talk about um, the audience participation element of a bit later. But let's just talk about the basic setup of, of pantomimes. Although they are all different stories... In reality, you do get quite a lot of the same ingredients each time you come and see one. Who would you expect to see in a panto? What's the the stock characters? Um, The stock characters are the principal villain, sometimes with an associated um, number two villain, um, a supernatural fairy or something who's always on the side of good, there will be the pantomime dame, possibly the most important character. Uh, and a pantomime dame, in case you don't know, in, um, in pantomime tradition, is a man dressed as a woman, usually playing the, uh, the main matriarchal character, if you like. By, uh, she's a mother or a governess or a nanny or something like that. Uh, Widow Twanky, who's in charge of the laundry in Aladdin, and his magic lamp is a very typical pantomime dame. Um, there will be the young romantic hero and the young romantic heroine, Sometimes, quite rarely now, the male lead, the romantic male lead, is played by a girl. That's called the principal boy. Um, but that's now extremely rare. Yep. We also have skin parts, too, of course, occasionally. Not, all, not in every story, but in some. Uh, yes, by skin parts, you, um, you're, you are, of course, referring to people dressing up as animals rather than pornographic film stars. Um, yes, and a tip- no. <laughs> and a typical one, of course, will be the cow in um, Jack and the Beanstalk. But you occasionally get camels in Aladdin and all manner. Of- There's the cat, of course, in, um, well, both Puss in Boots and indeed in Dick Whittington. The other thing that you have to mention is there's normally a comedy couple who are quite often associated with the villains but are kind of incompetent fun villains and are quite often redeemed at the end. Let's consider the structure of pantomimes. How is a pantomime classically structured? What sort of elements you need in, in terms of the story to keep people watching? Good person put in jeopardy by a bad person um, it looks like they're down and out everyone, all the good characters uh, gather together sometimes with the help of a supernatural character and overcomes the villain and everyone who deserves to lives a happy ever after life, whereas the bad ones sometimes are redeemed if they're the kind of comic villains uh, or if they're not they are usually disposed of is probably the best way of putting it yes, they're dispatched in some fashion occasionally violent but not always Captain Hook for example goes down to a, a crocodile famously in Peter Pan um, when that's done as a panto unless it's, unless it's a sequel which of course now Disney have done yes indeed yes so he, yes, he makes a, a triumphant return later on however that tells us just sort of the basic outline of the story there are actually particular episodes within all of that that are typical of the panto so for example you will start with um, as you and I know we start obviously with an opening number that's there in, as in all musicals to establish the world of the piece and usually it's a chorus number it doesn't always involve the main character although it can do sometimes the, the romantic female lead will be a part of that so you have that that's one major thing um then you normally have some kind of early jeopardy. Usually, it has to be said, um, to the, the dame character. Usually, it has to be said that they're going to be made homeless. Um, there's some kind of money problems, therefore they need to find money. Th- that would be the traditional thing. Right, so in Jack and the Beanstalk, that's why they have to sell the cow, is the f- uh, famous example. You usually have a song in there somewhere that will introduce your main character. Um, again, in musicals, usually called the I Want song, and it expresses their desire to be somewhere a little bit further along. 
uh, better, happier, richer. Mostly richer, if you're of the name. <laughs> yes, usually the dame's the one that's obsessed with material things, whereas the, the hero or heroine is the one that's obsessed with uh, more Aww. romantic things. Yes, exactly, the desire to, um, to grow up or the desire to get married, or both. There might be some typical scenes that don't necessarily come in a particular order, but, I mean, there are, are typical of pantos, for example. Well, the villain or the villain's henchman will um, gamma out on the stage periodically to rev the audience up into a frenzy of booing and hissing. Um, first of all, it establishes the credentials of the villain, because if you actually analyse what a villain, villain does in a pantomime, they very rarely actually are offering to do anything truly despicable. Um, Often, the, the plot makes no sense at all. <laughs> How dare you? Well, um, within the confines of the logic of the plot, the, 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 for example, in um, Dick Whittington, the, the principal villain is King Rat, who's somehow the, the leader of the Rat Troop, who you'd have thought in real life wouldn't be much of a, <laughs> wouldn't be much of an adversary for your grown typical grown man, um, but he seems to put up quite a good fight until the very end. Stage school kids often um, talking of the King Rat and his troop. There'll often be some kind of um, role for a little chorus. Um, we've maybe really mentioned them at the beginning. You'll also have um, a scene called the slosh scene, and that's where you have um, basically someone gets wet or someone gets like covered in custard, gunk, pie. custard pie or gunk of some kind. So the slosh scene, um, f- can you think of an example of a slosh scene? Um, well, these days, actually, on Dick Whittington, um, there's quite often a scene where the dame is the cook. And so they all go onto the boat, which is um, going to be sunk, so they can all end up on a desert island or a foreign country in Act 2 where Dick Whittington's cat does the works. He needs to do killing the rats and things. Um, but she says, oh, I'll come on the ship, I'll come on with you, and I will bake you a cake, allowing her... And then she'll p- take two members of the uh, cast who will provide her with the raisins and the flour and the water. But because the ship is rocking, do you see what's going to happen here? Mm. She's going to get a face... Or someone's going to get a face full of flour, powder and custard. Yes. Oh, the, another slightly more old-fashioned version is, of course, the paper in the parlour scene, which isn't done quite so often these days, but... Uh, consists of, well, two rather incompetent people papering the parlour. So, um, the incompetent couple, we've talked about those. Let's just think, you have a transformation scene. Now, that's most famously happens at the end of Act 1 in Cinderella. And it is a very literal transformation in that case. Cinderella is transformed into a woman, her dress is transformed. Uh, Cinderella is turned into a bookcase, and Act 2 isn't quite as thrilling as you would have liked. (laughs) Unless you read the end of the books. (laughs) In other pantomimes, it takes other forms. Jack has to decide to climb the beast. Usually there's a sort of point of decision has reached and the main character has to decide to, to become a grown-up and to face the danger, basically. That's kind of pretty much... Although in Cinderella's case, that's a, it's not a particularly high amount of danger, but I suppose it's facing her, um, her something that will cause her to grow up. And so basically that's, that's where... Um, and of course in Dick Whittington I think he has to decide to return to London doesn't he, that's his basic decision point uh, Having been banished for some trumped up charge normally, he's sort of exiled out of London but here's the, uh, the, the bells of the, the church and, um, which say to him, turn again Whittington So um, that's the structure of the first act, in the second act things don't tend to be quite so standard do they usually the character, or often the character will go to a sort of other, other worldly place in the case of Cinderella, we're off to the ball. In the case of Jack the Beanstalk, we're off to the, the sort of cloud land where the giant lives and the giant's wife. In the case of Dick Whittington, we're off to, well, for some reason, a desert island. I never really understood that bit. Um, well, actually, this is where the structures of the pantomimes quite often let themselves down. Jack and the Beanstalk is one of the stronger stories, and that it explains why its great success has continued, because... As you say, the first act is all about getting to the giant's kingdom in the sky. The second act, he doesn't just go to the kingdom and come back down again. He then goes back for a second helping. So, in fact, you've got enough material to take you through the second act. As you say, the problem with Dick Whittington, the second act is they're all on a ship which sinks. They find themselves in a desert island which is overrun by mice or rats. Dick Whittington's cat overcomes the problem, and so they have to pad that out quite a lot. So the second act of Dick Whittington is always quite disappointing. Cinderella is, once again, an odd story in the fact that it doesn't have a proper dame. It has the ugly sisters, who are always two men dressed as women. Two for the price of one, in fact. Indeed, but whereas the pantomime dame is normally a sympathetic character underneath her grotesquerie and always there for laughs, um, the ugly sisters are there for laughs, but they are not nice characters. They are, the, in fact, they are the least nice characters in Cinderella. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the elements um, later on too. Um, But for now, that's the theory. What we really should talk about now, and we will talk about, um, is the practice of how you put a pantomime on. It's a very frenetic experience, and of course it's one of the things that most actors understand because it's the main sort of source of work for them around this time of year. Um, 
And not just the actors, because underneath the stage, working very hard, probably harder than, again, they <laughs> have to work out in shows for the rest of the year, um, is a band, usually under the baton of some musical director. We know a musical director of Pantos, Jonathan Cohen, and Thos spoke to him about that whole experience. The very first professional gig I did was a pantomime at the Marlow Theatre in Canterbury. And it was Puss in Boots, and I had to write some songs for it, and that's where, where I really learned how to write sort of poppy stuff. I enjoyed it. It's just that you're doing two shows a day and uh, forever, it feels like. And, I mean, you're absolutely knackered by the, you know, it's it's very tiring thing to do. But I, I think if you're playing The Dame or something like that, it would be great. But sitting in the pit is pretty dreary. Uh, writing the songs, the thing about pantomime, of course, is it's ephemeral in the sense it runs a season and then next year it's all thrown away and you start yeah, again. something else. So tell me, did you, how much effort did you put into those songs? A lot, because don't forget, I hadn't really written anything. I mean, I was a classically trained person, so I, I didn't know much about that sort of stuff. I, yeah, I worked very hard on them. And the thing is, when I was doing those pantomimes at the Marlow Theatre, they weren't all the current pop songs. They were all specially written, which was much more interesting, mm. of course. You still get that occasionally, but it's rarer and rarer. It's very rare, and people don't want that. And, and in those days, you didn't have to have stars. You just had people who were very good actors and, you know, good comedians and whatever. You didn't have the latest soap star or whatever. Um, and, and you're quite right, because in those days, in, quite often there were gaps in the script that would just say, tiddly tree here, or something yeah. like that. And, and the actors would know it, because they'd done it for 30, 40 That's years. That's right. That's right. Um, and also we had to do incidental music. So, I mean, it, it was a great training ground. Thinking back on it, actually, I actually hadn't thought about that for ages. The first one I did was just two pianos and a drummer. And we had no to cast. really be... Inve- <laughs> no cast, no. And we had to be really inventive, but it was great. And we were able to get classical influences in and all those things. And they don't do that anymore. People just want to hear, f- watch Steps. people from the X Factor or whatever, you know. Panthers sell out anyway, whether there are stars in them, you know, or not. So, and they pay them huge amounts of money. Mm. So everybody else gets nothing. You know, the people who have been in the business for years and years and years and know their craft, you know, so well. And, and, you know, and somebody comes in and can't do it like a boxer or somebody else like that, you know. But, I mean, that, I'm afraid that's the way it goes. Did it make you laugh, bearing in mind you were putting in so much work? Oh, yes. I mean, we get lines like the <laughs> the um, the dame is down in the ogre's kitchen, right down in the basement. And she goes, it's so dark down, down here. I'm all of a quiver. Where are your lights? And the ogre says, next to me liver. <laughs> that did make me laugh a lot. But most people didn't know what lights were. A good butcher's joke. Yeah. Yeah, it made me laugh every night. But you decided never to do Panto again? <laughs> I did do another one. I did one at the Thorndike Theatre a long time ago in Leatherhead, which was rather good. But I have to say that it was just too long, you know, and I just thought, do I want to do this for the rest of, the rest of my life? If I ever run out of money, I might. Mm. <laughs> but just to touch on your television career, of course, you were also the uh, the musical supremo for the television's great comedy for children, uh, rent coast And there's one episode which is actually all about a pantomime. In fact, they all get turned into pantomime right. characters. And I think Chris Biggins was in that. Oh, he certainly was. He was Adam Painting. <gasps> My God, yes. Do you know, that's all coming back to me. And I remember trying to get the attention of the cast, and I couldn't because they were all jabbering away and gossiping as they always do. And Christopher Biggins just went, listen to the musical director! He did Richmond last year, and I went to that, and he, he, he's great. He's a great pantomime Dane. And he's a sweet guy. Uh, Tim and I also went to see that. Um, did you? Yeah, we did, I and mean, he was tremendously good. We'd gone the year before to see John Inman, and unfortunately John Inman was in the publicity but became ill with the, um, the oh. disease that ultimately killed him. Right. So we saw the understudy. Uh, and John Inman and Christopher Biggins are recognised in this country as the two great pantomime dames. And so the next year we were able to see Christopher Biggins, so at least we did one of a double. Did you like Chris? Yes, that? he was fantastic. He'd done, he'd done Cambridge for 25 years and decided he was going to give up Cambridge because I think he'd done everything he could there. I know. And came to Richmond and just bought the house down. Yeah, and did the same thing. But I'll tell you who did a brilliant, brilliant play, Dandini, I think, Julian Clary in Birmingham. He was absolutely hilarious and wonderful. Dandini's uh, Prince Charming's best friend in Cinderella. Yes, and he was absolutely fantastic. I mean, he was a scream. As I suspect he is in everything. (laughs) Yes. Welcome back to the Barbican Bar. Um, We're still a little way off the performance, so I guess we may as well continue to talk about how Panto is done. I heard from Jonathan Cohen there about uh, the experience of being a musical director in Panto. 
of course, they have to play the score. Now, we've talked a little bit already about the score, and we've talked about the introductory song, we've talked about the I Want song. Um, there are some other songs that you typically get in, uh, in a panto. I mean, care to name a few? Well, the most important in many ways, although actually the easier song, because it's quite often a traditional song, so you probably don't have to write it, is the sing-along. Usually happens towards the end of the second act, and it's after the mo- there's usually a kind of double ending in a pantomime. There's the big come-down, whereby you've um, defeated the principal villain, but then there's a kind of... And afterwards, there'll be a kind of um, a secondary... Oh, look, his henchman's still free. Oh, no, he's redeemed him or herself. But between that, they normally have something to do. Um, the, the, the cast will come on, the, the survivors, the good guys, the people who have succeeded, will come on and say, but we've still got this task which needs doing. It's opening the treasure chest or it's defeating this, that or the other. Um, and we can only do it if, for some reason or other, the audience join in and sing a very short and simple song with us. Something that sounds a little bit like this, in fact. So that's the audience participation song. Um, if you're lucky, on a good night, it doesn't go on for about five iterations. And if you're especially lucky, they don't divide the audience into two and get one side to compete against the other. Other sorts of songs that you might have in a panto um, would include, not necessarily inevitably, but invariably, there's some sort of romantic duet where the hero and heroine would hymn the pleasures of one another. Um, it might sound something a little bit like this. The town, the secret Um, Of course, the romantic duet is traditionally the place where most of the kids in the audience start to chatter among themselves and make noises with sweet rappers, Um, as we'll hear a a little later from uh, um, George Stars and Auntie Drew, which is why I think they avoided one, actually, in in this version of uh, Jack and the Beanstalk we're about to see. Other traditional story. Well, you'll have a dame's number, I suppose, as well. The dame um, often just has a sort of comic number quite early on in which she sort of introduces herself and her character. Um, here's how one of our sounds. I like pretty dresses, pretty little dresses. I like pretty dresses, though I am just a sham. The thing I must confess is that my life depresses. So wearing pretty dresses, it makes me feel so glam. The joy that I express is... Of course, the villain has to have a number as well. And there's always is this transformation number at the end of Act 1 which means that the hero has to go off. So you might get something where the hero discovers their destiny, a little like this. Don't be scared, just look inside yourself It is there, you just believe in yourself But if you can't... Or alternatively, you might get something where the villain announces their plans. A bit like this. Evil is creeping up on you. Evil has got control of you. Evil is what I want to be. T- and another example from Aladdin by Ronald Parr. This is the Widow, t- Widow Twanky's Dame song. As a shy young miss, I dreamed of bliss with a tall romantic he-man, but I lost my heart to a spruce and smart, though shortish, able seaman. One afternoon, on our honeymoon, he said, I'll see you later. A berth I found on a liner bound for the glamorous equator. In addition, um, there's all manner of different styles, and it's typical of a panto that it uses um, all kinds of different styles, from Latin... You've got a look that says, evil, cunning, wicked and bad. I've got a thought... Through to rock... I'm evil. And through to the sort of traditional musical theatre sound. And that is, of course, if you've got a properly written score. It has to be said that there's a trend more and more to uh, lifting pop songs and then writing new lyrics for them, which has the advantage of being more known by the audience, but on the other hand, it's slightly less satisfying as a piece of musical drama. Yeah, exactly, because they tend to be, well, they're occasionally a bit crowbarred into the situations, aren't they? Uh, yes, I think you're being extremely generous there. A bit crowbarred is by, like being beaten around the head with a pillowcase full of doorknobs. Well, I think in 2005, I remember that, of course, there was a big fuss about the, um, uh, the song Is This the Way to Amarillo? And every panto that year somehow managed to squeeze it in with a, by some reference to Amarillo. Who knows how they got it in? Well, not always. Is this the way to stuff a pillow? You know, <laughs> there are plenty. But, you know, if you're cleaning the house, that's a perfectly decent song to add. So that's the five-minute guide to writing a score for a panto. Um, 
we haven't talked yet about the process, the nightmare process of directing a panto. We're going to hear now from Adele Anderson, not only a cabaret artist extraordinaire in her own right, but also the director of and uh, star of Panto. Here's what uh, she has to say on the subject. I absolutely adore it, yes. Uh, of course, I always play Wicked Queen, apart from one fabulous year when um, uh, Ian Liston of the Hiss and Boo Company mm. t- took a real punt and he cast Dilly and myself as ugly sisters <laughs> down, in, down in Barnstable. No, 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 we, we wanted it. All oh, right. I mean, he'd said to Dilly originally, would you like to be in one of my pantos? And she said, well, I don't want to be a good fairy. She said, that's very dull. The only part I would ever really want to play is, um, is Ugly Sisters with Adele. And he said, oh, leave it with me. And Barnstable, bless them, the Queen's City of Barnstable, uh, kindly allowed us to do it. When the show then moved on the following year, mm. nobody else would, would take us because, oh. we're, because women aren't allowed to play Ugly Sisters unless they happen to be married to mm. one of the other Ugly Sisters. Yeah. I think that's how it works. But we were, fa- we were fantastic Ugly Sisters. I looked like an even more rattled version of Patsy in that fair. <laughs> and Dilly looked like Baby Jane. Yeah. So... Um, so there we go, and we we had the most we had the m- most marvelous time, and we had you know no shame, and uh, and uh, but normally as I say I, I play Wicked Queen, and then some years ago Tamara Malcolm, who was running the theatre royal uh, the the, the, the theatre at Chipping Norton, rang me up and said I'd like you to direct a panto. Well, that was another mm-hmm. you know, um, <laughs> crossing the legs moment. I thought <laughs> I've never directed anything in my life. I don't think I could. But luckily, Sarah Travis was musically directing it and writing all the songs for it, so I knew I'd, I'd, I'd be working with a, with a pal. And I did it by... Um, I actually got quite methodical about it, and I made a game plan and divided up the speeches and blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I have to say that my actors said it was the nicest experience that they'd had, and I, if I, I never kept anybody waiting. It's amazing how Very many directors unusual. do. You know, you turn up, you sit around on your behind for a couple of hours... Uh, I never kept anybody waiting or if I did for five or ten minutes I would go out and uh, apologise to them and we we got a very good review in the Daily Telegraph mm. and so then I was invited back the following year uh, to direct Aladdin and I did a really um, multi-ethnic um, casting I I gave Dean Hussein his equity card he then went into Miss Saigon and now mm. he's been um, playing uh, the devil in Jerry Springer on tour I had a beautiful beautiful um, Eurasian girl as the princess had a had a, a black genie so uh it was yeah it was a, I, was, I, I was very proud of both those productions back to the uh, bar of the barbican it's starting to get a bit busier now so uh, we're not too far off uh, beginning the performance of uh, jack and the beanstalk um however there's an element we still have to talk about which is the audience participation don't we oh yes we do Oh, oh, no, we don't. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, no, we don't. And so on and so on until, yes. <laughs> until thermal death point. It sounds a little bit like this. You can shout them, Danny. His name's Jack. After three. One, two, three. Jack! Jack! One, two, three. Jack! And is repeated, well, quite a lot of times throughout the thing. Now, it does keep the audience engaged. Very much. It's usually the character identifier, if you like. Um, quite often the, the hero, but more often the dame, will come on and say, Oh, hello, my name is Widow Twanky. Every time I come on, boys and girls, I want you to shout, Hello, Widow Twanky, you're tall and long and lanky, or something like that. Um, right, so we've got the catchphrase. Uh, there might be other types of things. Uh, there's a, of course, there's a famous ghost sequence that you see, tend to see in pretty much every panto. I think we finally saw one last year that didn't use it for the first time ever. It's, yes, it's one where a usually relatively random villain, perhaps like a mummy, if they're anywhere near Egypt, so Aladdin might someone s- scrape that in, or a grotesque or a monster or a man in a skeleton suit, um, is menacing the usually four good guys on the stage, one of whom is the dame, who's usually made up to look a little bit grotesque. They will sit on a bench and sing a song to keep themselves cheerful in the frightening situation, and one by one, the skeleton, the skeleton will come up and one by one tap one on the shoulder, frighten him or her off, and they'll run off the stage, and therefore there's only three left on but the stage. But you're missing the critical audience participation aspect of this. There's a particular thing that the audience have to say. And that is behind you, or some variant upon that. Yes, it's a sort of warning to the, the character. 
characters upon the stage, which they always ignore. So what's the point, I say? And the punchline of that particular sequence is that three people are whittled down to two, two people are whittled down to one who's always the dame. Finally, you think you're going to get a repeat of that, but they, the dame turns around and the skeleton stroke monster stroke mummy will look in a shock at the horrific figure before him or her and run off themselves with hilarious consequences. And it never changes from year to year. Um, although I did notice that Peter Duncan, when he directs Pantos, he, they've added, well, I, I don't know if he originated it, I doubt he did actually, but uh, um, they have a little, a little special sequence about, well, we'll have to sing it again then, won't we? Yes. There's a little bit of a, um, he's found a bit of a spin on it, but it's still fundamentally the same scene that ends exactly the same way every single damn time. But there we are, that's Panto. It's traditional, so lump it. <laughs> um, it's, it's all part of the fun. It's all part of the fun. Um, we had a great deal of fun when we went to see um, George Stiles and Anthony Drew to ask them about the process of constructing this particular panto, Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, we're joined once again to talk about panto by George Stiles and Anthony Drew. Thank you very much indeed for coming along. Oh, very welcome. Well, well, we nice came along here, you. actually, technically, <laughs> but never mind. Um, <laughs> lovely to see you in any case. Um, now, I believe you're working on a panto at the moment. Word reaches me. Oh, no, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> Splendid. So, um, tell me all about it. We know it's at the Barbican. We know that uh, Jonathan Harvey of Gimme 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 fame and Beautiful Thing fame has written the, th- what we in musical theatre call the book, although in Panto they call the script. So <laughs> what's your role in the whole proceedings? I've no idea. <laughs> Have you worked that out yet? George is an usherette. I've ah. written about ten songs. Right, OK. Single-handedly, haven't you? Yes, I guess the tunes. It came about... Are they all played just with one hand? <laughs> <laughs> and they're hummed. Um, <laughs> It came about because last year, as you may remember, Mark Ravenhill was responsible for the first ever yes. home-produced um, that's pantomime. Right, which was Dick Whittington, I think. Whittington. And you did... We wrote an opening song An opening that. song, yeah. that's right. Along which with, was alongside Jim Bob and yes, Silly Keen. Yes, it, 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 it was a funny mixture yeah. of people. And in actual fact, I think with hindsight, they thought it would have benefited to have had more of a, a musical overview on the whole evening rather than just... Is very varying writing teams sending stuff in. There mm. wasn't much rewriting going on. I don't right, think yeah. They asked several people if they'd like to submit something. They submitted it, and then yeah. they felt and can we have it by on a bound a to couple of weeks' time? And exactly. Yes. Yeah. And Sarah so Travis put it all together with the arrangements. That's right. That's right. It was it was good. It was it was ambitious, and I'm not sure that the I'm not sure that the Barbican's resources absolutely matched up to the ambition of the project. But the wonderful thing is they've learned, and everybody's made a fantastic jump forward this year. And it really is an incredibly handsome show. Now, this is an interesting point, actually, because one of the first things I wanted to ask you was that uh, is it different to writing musical theatre? Now, it sounds like, from th- what you just said, that they're kind of moving in a more musical theatre, more integrated type of direction for Panto. We all agreed with the director, Giles Havergal and Jonathan, that we would try and write more or less as rigorous a show as a musical yeah. except we would include all the great Pantro tradition sure I'll try and say that again. <laughs> all the great Pantro tradition all the great Pantro tradition that's easy for you to say that's very easy for me to say no, no, we, we did we, approach it like a musical really we were presented initially with a treatment that Jonathan yeah. had come up with and ideas of where songs might possibly go mm-hmm. then we started writing one or two songs for it thinking it might be five songs yeah. and as the process went on and we started to have then slightly more constructive meetings with with Giles and with Jonathan, um, they kept saying, oh, can we have a song here? Can we have a reprise there? And oh, okay. it, it ended up being rather more, more, more songs than we thought it was going to be. So we then, strangely, we were going to Los Angeles to go and work out there for a, a month and have meetings and do all of that blah, blah, blah that you try and do to get a career over there. Mm-hmm. And, we, um, and, we, and we, when we were there, while we weren't having our meetings and sunning ourselves, we literally got up every morning, 10 o'clock, Ants would come round to my little studio apartment. We put the Murphy bed in the wall, got the keyboard out... And we wrote a song a day. I mean, it was more than a song a day. We actually wrote pretty much ten songs a week. I don't think we've week. ever been quite that prolific. Right. Was, I, I would, give, I would we give George a lyric, and then I went back to my little studio apartment, yeah. where I didn't put my Murphy Villa, but I lay on it, <laughs> and, um, and I'd write the next one. And George, right. It got to a point when George said, slow down, because I'm getting behind. And I, was, I was also trying to and demo them as we went, yes, because yeah. I took my computer and then well, we hard drive stuff. Well, we know the music stuff. Oh, of course it does. It's far <laughs> harder as we write, you know, Tim, thank you. <laughs> Could I just quickly ask, Ashley, if you're producing the song so quickly, though, does that allow you, does it make it easier to write an integrated score or not? I think the great thing about Panto is that you really are kind of dealing with it number by number. But what we'd already planned was that we knew that certain titles were going to allow us to do reprises. Hmm. So you have that useful musical theatre device of reprising stuff. But to be honest, no, it... it, it I think it's probably not as complicatedly interlinked as a full musical that had germinated over two or three years would be. But that said, I, I think, uh, it's, I think what's wonderful is I think our, 
our songwriting craft is what you, you in that period of time you can mm. just go here's a song here's a song here's a song and we're kind of pleased with all of them which is really nice we well, deliberately didn't want them to um we didn't want them to sound like like they would in a musical where there's some sort of coherence to the musical style for, for a pantomime i think you want to keep surprising the audience especially mm-hmm. younger members of the audience mm. so we were probably slightly more aware of writing songs in different genres as we went for example and also we didn't want it to be ballad heavy because kids won't sit through ballads. You hear seats tipping up and stuff. So we um, okay. we deliberately avoided ballad territory. In fact, we've got no ballads in it at all. <laughs> but so what, we, what are you going to play for us now? We open with a kind of very Disney-esque beginning, which we thought would be fun to go. In this bog-standard town, full of bog-standard people, there's a bog-standard church with its bog-standard steeple. All our citizens are friendly and compliant. Oh, did we mention there's our own bog standard giant? Ash! On this bog standard day, there's a bog standard fair. Lots of bog standard stalls fill the bog standard square. Selling goods and chattels to each passing client Did we mention we've our own box and a giant? Ah! He's a giant amongst giants A monster amongst trolls And he always comes out top In all the tallest person polls In almost all respects he is humongous And in between his toes He grows an evil-smelling fungus And so on in this fashion But sort of silly fun to put lots of giant rhymes And um, lots of people screaming a lot Interesting you bring the giant in from the beginning So I don't want to spoil the surprise for anybody Within the play he's alluded to from the beginning Right, okay At the very top of the show you meet Fairy Liquid Right Up on her star (laughs) Yep And she meets up in the stratosphere Beastly Boris who is the giant's henchman, who comes down periodically to, to find people or cows to turn into pies to, to feed to the giant. So you do know from, from the get-go that um, there's a giant who also controls the kingdom in which our show takes place. Right, OK. Do you have panto memories yourself, by the way? Of, like, yeah, many, Presumably many. you've... Yes, in a few. I mean, from the age of, like, three, I guess, we were taken to pantomimes as a family. Um, back in the late 60s, I suppose it was, the London Palladium used to produce enormous, very, very glitzy pantomimes. I remember seeing Silla Black as Aladdin with Leslie Crowther as, as um, Wishy Washy. Yes. Terry Scott was a dame. I saw Derek Nimmo, Julian Orchard, Edward Woodward, right. Laurie okay. Lapino Lane. There was, a, there was a whole <laughs> mixture of people. Yeah. But they were really big family musicals. Yeah. And at the time, I, and for instance, with Silla Black, I remember she had a hit song at the time. In, you know, it was like a number one hit. Sure. Um, Step inside, love. <laughs> <laughs> no, if something tells me something's going to happen. Tonight. Something tells me something. Oh, we love. That. You sound more like <laughs> the crankies when you do that. <clears throat> so, um, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I was brought up on them. And John Gale used to produce pantomimes out at, at the Assembly Halls in Tunbridge Wells, which yeah. is near me. The Hazlitt Theatre in Maidstone still produces um, pantomimes. So, yeah, I went to a lot of pantomimes. And we, d- and we had a shared panto experience at Exeter University where we met mm-hmm. um, because they did an original panto. Uh, they, had a, they had a season at the Northcott where they used actors who came back for every single play, so more or less a repertory season. Yeah. And that culminated in a panto at the end of the year. And it had this fabulous end-of-term feeling about it. And it was written by Rory McGrath, R- Rory McGrath and Jimmy Mulville and I think directed by Nick Heitman. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was uh, it was just enormous, enormous fun. And the songs I can remember two or three of the songs to this day, having heard them once. Mm. And that's what made me think: oh, you can combine all the "He's behind you" and "Oh no, you're not" stuff with an original take on an original story. And with it a was contemporary what, what, what was spin. Do you remember what sort of t- it, was it was Aladdin. It was Aladdin. It was Aladdin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it didn't rely on big names being in it. In the no. same way that we're not at the Barbican. Yeah. In a way, it relied in the same way that Trevor Nunn did when he did Honk at the National. It relied on a sort of end of term romp for, yeah. the, for the resident company. So we, as students, have been to everything. Have been at the Northwood all year. So we recognise Mike Burnside and yeah. you know, Amanda Orton and the various characters, actors who've been there during the season. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? That it has that sort of local aspect and that recognition aspect and that sort of almost villagey feel because every village mm-hmm. as well it sort of is what it's about, isn't it? I yeah. mean, it's about. I mean, in the on the big ones, it's about celebrating events that have happened that year 
you know, you know, every panto in London has always whinged about the congestion charge for yeah, the last the ten years. You know, yeah, it's yeah. whatever the thing is that this year, or it's free newspapers, or it's uh, the, the latest curse of waiting for queues at the airport. I mean, it, 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 there's always an issue. There's yeah. jokes about Virgin Trains this year, and that, hasn't it? You know, if there's, you make it. That's, that's the deal. It's got to be topical, and it's yeah. got to reflect the mood it's got to reflect the times just like i suppose like all good theater does yeah but it's a celebration of sort of the best of the year in a way it is it's a sense of i think it's one of those good things that should only be specific to the calendar at that moment yeah yeah so i mean presumably that's so if you, we, we did the, we heard the show again jack and Eastall, you might do some rewrites or would you, you, or would you prefer to leave it just with the, this year's thing I don't know, we haven't got strong thoughts on it really. I've, I've just come back from Inverness where they've just opened this new theatre up there and I spoke to Colin Marr, the producer, and he's interested in the possibility of doing Jack and the Beanstalk. But my first thought was the gags will need updating because they're about Kerry Katona and yeah. Virgin Trains and things. That's the sort of area you can, you can um, update, I think. Most of our songs are less specific to now. They're much more right. integral to the story. I think that it, that you leave room in the book to update the gags. For example, The yes. Dame... Oh, a wonderful, wonderful dame. wonderful dame. I think he's one of the most brilliant dames I've ever seen in my life. He's called Andy Gray. He's from north of the border. He's never done Panto Dame in the south. And he's, uh, he's just a joy. He's a complete joy. Uh, completely gets it. It's a very strong cast. And, we, and as soon as we... Well, even before we knew it was him, we thought we'd have fun. Because you give us a mean dame, don't you? You're going to give us your raising the moolah. Oh. This is when they've, they're all poor. Give us the your dame, dame is poor. <laughs> and her two boys, Matty and Jack. Mad yep. Matty and Idle Jack. Um are trying to suggest ideas of how they can raise some money. Yep. Um, and, of course, there's Daisy the Cow off stage yes. the entire time, trying to get in on the song. So whenever you hear them, mmm, Daisy's trying to join in. And we thought we'd have some fun with the idea of moo and yep. the word for money being moolah. Oh, so okay. um, Dolly's very sad about it. I should just point out for listeners that Anthony's now got into his dress. <laughs> and he's ready to <laughs> give us his... And his rosebud lips are puckered up, ready for the opening <laughs> night. I don't have the Midas touch... We're not as rich as Croesus. When beastly Boris comes along, the devil tries to fleece us. What's a widow meant to do when her rent is overdue? I'm so sad. Aww. I'm sadder than that. Aww. Everyone has problems, but I've got so many. Money isn't funny when you don't have any. Nothing's worse than knowing you can't spend a penny. I don't think that life can get much crueler. What are we gonna do to raise the moolah? Ooh. Not now, Daisy. Let's try cash in the attic. There's nothing in my loft. Well, what about your hard earnings? I'm afraid they've all gone soft. Perhaps we could play tools, cause I'm a bit like Lara Croft. What's a widow meant to do when her rent is overdue? Everyone has problems, but we've got so many. Money isn't funny when you don't have any. Nothing's worse than knowing you can't spend a penny. I don't think that life can get much crueler. What are we gonna do to raise the moolah? Moolah! Not now, Daisy. Hey, what about a boot fair? Our motor car was nicked. I've tried to win the lotto. But your balls were never picked. I could meet Simon Cowell and hope that something clicked. What's a widow meant to do? When a rent is overdue. Everyone. Excellent. You get the flavour. So we're kind of doing a little bit of a madness moment going on there. A bit of a comes bit of a Bit of a double entendre fest as well, Do of course. We, really? Oh, Where? <laughs> no idea what you were talking about. It was under the smart. wrong part. All <laughs> pure. <laughs> you nearly threw yourself by being funny there, didn't you? <laughs> no, I just forget it goes on. Oh, do you? That's so have you, have you had much involvement in the rehearsals? Presumably you've seen some of it going on? Yeah, we, we were there. I mean, it's just like doing the first day of rehearsals of the musical. We, are, we, we were all together at, up at the National Youth Theatre mm -hmm. and um, the cast all read their lines and George and I sang all the songs yeah. because at you know, that point they didn't know them. Yeah. And we popped back again you know, now and again, to see how Looked it's coming in. on. How's it all going, yeah. guys? Yeah. Occasionally ask for a new little reprise here and there, or a little, mm -hmm. uh, sort of a, a more melancholy version of one of the songs. I've popped in rather more often than Anthony has, gentle <laughs> listener, <laughs> because the musicians work so much harder. <laughs> <laughs> There's always so many problems to solve. You heard it here first. <laughs>
But so you're both your happy next collaborator will be. <laughs> 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 but you're certainly happy with the way it's looking. Sure. I think George has found his niche in the world of panto. I'm staying with him. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a double entendre in niche? <laughs> Um, sorry, what was your question? <laughs> no, no, merely that you, you, it sounds as though you are, but you're, you're happy with the way it's going, and do you expect to tweak it as it actually starts? Oh, we so have. You, we've, yeah, Jonathan's we have been bit, tweaking yeah. the script. We've, well, He's I, written the giant out. Yeah, well, you don't <laughs> need just him, do you? Jack, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just Jack. We Exclamation have, nice mark. <laughs> one, of, one of the other lovely traditions of Pantos is, is transformation scenes, and mm. they've always been the thing that I remember as a, as a kid, going that... So yeah. you think, you know, it's a sort of glittery and tatty and lovely and funny, and then suddenly this glorious thing happens which you don't see coming. And, of course, there's a beanstalk growing in this one. Yes. So we wrote a... a t- and this, this one came about sort of, I don't know, a bit accidentally. You, you'll spot that Anthony read zoology and biology at university <laughs> yes, yes, we when it comes into this lyric. Living, yeah. um, because we have words that, frankly, without doubt, have never been set to music in the history yeah, of the haven't. world. Are we getting Dawkins the musical here? <laughs> 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 well, it's, it's I tell you, my botany lecturer X will be thrilled with it. So the fairies, okay. led by Fairy Liquid, who's played by the brilliant Mel with the unpronounceable surname. <laughs> I want to call her Glidrock, but it's not actually said like that, is we'll it? We'll do some research and get back but to it. But Mel, Mel, Mel and Sue, and she's just fantastic, and she sings, To germinate a seed and leave all gardeners agog Add a shovel full of peat dug from our own bog standard bog Now all green-fingered fairies, you must chant along with me We will turn a humble bean into a vegan Fantasy Aaron Keimer, Colin Keimer, Scleron Keimer cells. You must now prepare yourselves, give in to fairy spells, xylem, phloem, lignin, chlorophyll, and floribanda. We ask you to go. other words for green add a bit more inspiration to our little buried bean the rules of horticulture do not hold too much allure but a little fairy spell is worth three buckets of manure parenchyma colenchyma sclerenchyma cells you must now prepare yourselves give in to fairy spells Okay. And that's the sing-along, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's on the song That's the one that everybody has to learn before they come down. It would have been quite funny to actually just bring that one in. Yeah. And then we, oh no, wrong. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, well, the sing-alongs often have nonsense words, isn't it? That's what you could possibly good do. Good idea, we'll put that in that's next That's good. You see, anybody who's thinking that for Panto you don't need a degree in anything to write it, you know, clearly you do. <laughs> and they're nice words, words, too. You know, it's yeah. meant to be the fairy casting her spell. Yeah. I noticed a few stylesisms in the, the, the piano figures at the very top of the score. Oh, the... Yes, do I, where do I know that from? It's, uh, well, it's all John Williams, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. No, you sort of recognise it a little bit from Mary Poppins. I, yeah, do, I, I use that for Fly a Kite instead. That's of, right. Yeah. I use, just that. That's right, yeah. Just to give it sort of... It's lovely. It's lovely. It's very so, yeah, no, it's my, it's my uh, chord progression of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Nominations are in. <laughs> so a quick bit of a quick bit of a bit more Dane because the uh, of course you had to just be rude, didn't you? You had to spoil it all and be vulgar. <laughs> it's all in your mind, George. <laughs> so we've got so oh, so we're going to get some nice rude stuff now. Well, it's only on the uh, on the on the verge of being rude, but I you know with with a, with a show that's about it's beans. It's just virgin, I'm right. <laughs> 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 with a show about beans, beans. Exactly. it had to be a song about. Beans. The effect beans have on one. Oh, yes. So the dame is furious when Jack comes home. Yeah, it's a gas. And okay. he says, I got five. And he says, what, 500? <laughs> he says, 500, 5,000. No, five. Five beans. And the dame is just absolutely furious because, you see... Of all the veg you could have chosen, fresh or tin or deeply frozen, why'd you have to swap the cow for beans? 
Cause when I have beans in my diet, it's hard to keep my bottom quiet. This lady down the front knows what that means. Give me wind, beans make me blow. Beans start to bubble, causing trouble down below. Beans give me gas right from the start. Beans make my body burp. Beans make me shh. Beans make me grunt. Beans make me groan. Beans make me broadcast without a microphone. Beans make me trump. Things fall apart. Beans get me blowing off. Beans make me shh. Eat anything leguminous. My knickers get voluminous. There's little cause for you to laugh and scoff. For once when I ate haricots, that night in bed I almost froze because I found I'd blown the duvet off. Beans make me guff, beans make me pop, beans make me drop something it isn't nice to drop. Beans make me toot right off the chart, beans cause a nasty smell. Beans make me... Beans start a gust, beans start a gale, beans cause a blast that features on the Richter scale. Beans are a curse, time to depart. Beans give me flatulence, no, this ain't art. No, this ain't art. Beans give me flatulence, beans make her, beans make her, beans make me... Mother. Oh, <laughs> well, it's splendid. silly, really, isn't it? It's very lovely. The children <laughs> absolutely adore it yes. because you know, they're going to go for the, more, more the, the love degree song. of rudeness. Is just <laughs> perfect, <laughs> and they're all scouting farts from the other stalls. Of course, stores, of course which they is just want to supply the missing uh, ingredients, so to speak. <laughs> yes, that's it's perfect. a white hall farts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So that's good. So, are, are there any other songs that you, you like to cover from the, this one? But then oh, we'll a quick talk. burst of that. We we had a very silly time writing that. We we wanted to we jokingly referred to the Act One closer for a long time as yeah. "Climb Every Beanstalk." Right, <laughs> and it was quite hard to shake that thought, was. wasn't it? But then we came. He came up with a very good little idea to play with the rhyme of climate. Um, and I used every single rhyme, as you know. It's hard to find that many rhymes yes. for rhyme. Yes. Um, but so climb I, is one. <laughs> climb is one of them. So yeah. I, 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 um, I compiled a list, and I think I used just about all of them. Every single possible one. So Jack begins it. Sometimes your destiny is waiting round the bend for you. Maybe I will make myself a friend or two. Sometimes challenges confront us that require us to be strong. If you haven't got the gist yet, I'll explain it in this song. If you write a poem, then you have to rhyme it. If you watch a race run, then you want to time it. If you see a church bell, well, you're gonna chime it. If you see a beanstalk growing, then you know you're going to climb it. If you make a hot pot, you should sage and time it. If you're painting bare wood, then you have to prime it. If you want a fun show, you should pantomime it. If you see a your beanstalk growing, then you know you're going to climb it. So leave the earth below. No fears of vertigo. Turn it blue. When you reach the ozone layer, there's a hole you can climb through. A hole to climb through. When you clean an engine, then you must degrime it. When you're mixing mortar, then you ought to lime it. If you need a hero, then you know that I'm it. If you see a beanstalk growing, then you know you're going to climb it. Yeah, that's 
Yes. So those are the climate changes. Yes. I did bring that up in rehearsals once when we changed the song. I said we yeah, yeah. should call this climate changes. <laughs> you touch <laughs> on the ozone. Very good. Uh, well, there, there was a, there's a great middle eight which we didn't. Oh, I haven't got the lyric in here, but there's a good. Um, at the end of the second, going skyward on a beanstalk, oh, it's the greenest way to travel. Ah. All our problems will be solved. Going climb, skyward on a beanstalk, carbon footprints aren't involved. Yes, so we managed to get Oh, we're cutting it. Oh, what? Yes. <laughs> Splendid, yes. I mean, it's, 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 Topicality and everything. That sounds, it sounds fantastic. Should we close we're that score looking, now? Yes, we're looking <laughs> okay. very much forward to seeing it. It's on the Barbican. Um, Giles Havergal is the director, and yeah. Jonathan Harvey, and as we said, wrote the book. Hadn't and it? Jeff Garrett has choreographed it, who was our associate choreographer from Mary Poppins. Okay, and the wonderful Andy Massey has uh, musically directed it, and even got David White to do the arrangements. I mean, it's, it's top flight musical it's material, top isn't it? So, back to the Barbican foyer. Um, first of all, I've just seen the panto that uh, Stars and Drew were just talking about, um, Jack and the Beanstalk. And uh, jolly good fun it was too. And I have to say, considerably more integrated, as um, I think Anthony said in the interview, than um, last year where they had a lot of different uh, people doing the, the score. Um, you may be able to hear the sound of bird song behind me. I promise you we are actually in the Barbican foyer. It's just that they've piped in some nice enchanted forest sounds. So, thoughts, what did you make of the, uh, the panto? Um, well, overall, excellent. Um, I was particularly impressed by the score. I thought it was one of the wittiest, particularly wittiest set of lyrics I've heard for a very long time in any pantomime. Um, I like the quality of the jokes. I just wish there'd been a few more. And I thought overall it took a few minutes to get into its stride. That's the, the, the headlines for me. Yeah, I, I would certainly tend to agree. I thought the performances were extremely strong indeed. Um, there was uh, We had an understudy on tonight um, playing the dame and um, that led to um, a certain amount of insecurity sometimes around the lines. Stuart Ellis. It was Stuart Ellis, yeah. Um, which was which the cast made enormous fun of and, uh, and they managed to um, really, you know, just... Incorporate. That's one of the nice things about Panto. You can always incorporate mistakes into the flow of the uh, of the show, which is uh, a wonderful thing, frankly. Um, but yeah, I agree. the The score was very witty. I thought the lyrics were extremely, you know, neat. Um, couldn't always hear every single one of them, but actually, you know, for a Panto score, you could hear an awful lot of them, and you could certainly appreciate the the cleverness of the rhymes. I like the gospel number that finished Act One. That was very nice that we've heard uh, before in the interview. Um, so all in all, I think they they managed to tick all of the boxes of traditional panto. We had the um, the ghosties and ghoulies, the behind you scene that, as predicted, they did it a little bit differently this time. They actually did it as a musical number, which I felt was um, paying it off a little bit differently. M- much stronger. It's the first time it's actually worked for me. I thought I, I found myself laughing at the end. Yeah, the problem is it's such a cliche that you do you have seen it. I've seen it many hundreds of times, and we've avoided putting it in our own pantos for precisely that reason. So I'm glad they managed to do something different with it this time. I'll pick up just a couple of the, the jokes. There's a couple of um, there's a great one right at the beginning. The dame, in response to some insulting comment to her, says, "I'm not over the ill yet." To which her, one of her sons says, "No, but you've got a pretty good view." Um, and then one of the lyrics was, um, "I'm fed up playing. Um, I'm fed up playing baddies." Um, though I seem to fill that niche, I'd rather not cook a pie. I'd rather make a quiche. Yes. Um, Steve First, I think we had as the uh, um, Boris. as the Boris, the um, the villain's henchman, as you quite rightly said, because the giant, the giant, they managed to stage very well. Yes, that was very clever. First of all, it was done with lights, so um, a relatively large actor was in the wings with lights behind him, so he looked fifteen times taller on stage. And then later on, they cut to the, the actor in real life and reduced the rest of the cast to puppets on the table, which was brilliantly done. In fact, I have to say, some of the puppetry was very good. There was a, a really wonderful dinosaur. Yes, it was very well made. Although unfortunately, the dinosaur was a little bit fragile, so they weren't able to have Jack fight it in any sort of sense. And one. Th- I, I agree that the um, the way they realised the giant scene with the puppetry was great. It was, in fact, it was the sort of thing that you see like in Edinburgh shows and things like that. You know, because you have to find a creative way of changing the scale of the thing, and you can't afford. Well, nobody nobody can stage a, a, a real giant coming on. Um, although I have seen it attempted a couple of times. However, they did that the thing of changing the scale. Uh, they did one thing which was a little bit disappointing, which is that when it came to actually the giant. Um, them. I'm going to give away the ending here, yeah. but the giant dies, okay? <gasps> um, and uh, Mummy, um, he dies. So. He dies climbing down the beanstalk. And uh, one of the th- unfortunate things about that is that they did that occurrence. Although they they realised the visuals of that very well, you only saw the aftermath. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, um, Mel Geerdroich, I think it is, 
um, was forced to um, give us it like Shakespeare style. It's like, oh, there's a great big battle going on, and oh my goodness, look, and oh, you know, it was like the spithead commentary, frankly. The pity is that they had used lights very cleverly uh, all the way through in the second act when you're in the giant's domain, the, the, the enchanted but evilly enchanted forest was done beautifully with lights. Um, she was running around the stage, as you say, describing what happened. They could have at least done a sh- shadow show. I think, they, yes, I think it, it, there was a slight feeling of, like, the, the tech must have finished yes. at that point of the narrative. A massive anticlimax in that sense, which was a great pity. Really, also, I have to say, quite a complicated sing-along song. Yes, it was a very complicated thing. Although, um, what I liked about a lot of this show um, is that they used, well, as we've heard in the interview, they used a lot of um, botanical um, jargon, in effect, but actually in a really creative way. And I, I do like things that, that you get a tiny bit of science. It was very jocular science, but it was a little bit of science in the, um, uh, in the sing-along song. And it was all about uh, the bee wipes some pollen on his bum-bum-bum. <laughs> <laughs> which is very witty. There were a couple of other things I'd like to mention. Um, we've mentioned the uh, puppet show. Um, one or two of the orchestrations were very strange. Act 2 opened on an 80s throwback. It was a nice song. Yes, it, it had a very strong... Well, actually, I thought it was... Um, there was a sort of Euro beat feel to it, basically. It was like a... It, uh, I don't know what the proper term is, but it was like happy techno. <laughs> um, it was very dis- disco-y, but like disco from the, the late 90s, I thought, was the sort of style. I mean, pe- I sort of post Pet Shop Boys sort of uh, um, uh, style of, of club sort of uh, dance music. Um, so yeah, that was a bit. Uh, it was great actually. I, you know, it was nice to hear at least something more modern being attempted. So you can't fault it on that on those grounds. And of course, Jonathan Harvey had worked with the Pet Shop Boys before on uh, the musical um, Closer to Heaven. A um, couple more jokes. Um, they decide when they're going to sell the cow that Daisy the cow needs a clean, and somebody says, "Oh, should we take her to a cow wash?" <laughs> Um, Groan. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's an exchange between two of them where somebody is, uh, where um, Jack is offered five pieces of gold, and she says, "Gosh, that's more than." And someone interrupts, four pieces of gold." <laughs> um, have you got the Frosties gag? I haven't got that. Let's sorry. tell, let's well, tell one, them the Frosties. Oh, well, okay. There's one more first. Uh, there's a lovely moment where the dame, um, she's reacting with the audience, and she finds two sisters. She spots two sisters in the audience, so she, um, she says to them, are you two sisters? And they go, yes. She says Cinderella was busy this evening then, was she? <laughs> and Splendid. And finally, so the I pièce de résistance. <laughs> the dame is talking about her other son, the one that isn't Jack, Matty, and she's saying that when he was a boy, he, was, he said, mummy, mummy, I can't do my tiger jigsaw. I can't understand how to put all the pieces together. And she said, that's a box of Frosties. <laughs> Marvellous. That's a good joke. Hello, I'm Becky Applin, and I'm delighted to be with you to talk about pantomime. So, what is a panto? Well, we know it's likely to be a well-known story, uh, Jack and the Beanstalk, or Mother Goose, or Aladdin. Uh, We know there'll be a man in a frock. We know there's likely to be a love story, although it'll probably be between a girl and another girl playing the principal boy. There'll be a baddie, there'll be a fairy godmother or another goodie. There's likely to be some kind of social class divide that gets in the way. There'll be lots of slapstick, one-liners and jokes, innuendos and so on. But what about the music? What do we expect the music to be like in a pantomime? Well, all too often now, uh, the music is usually made up of covers of S Club 7 or other pop groups, which have really very little to do with the plot and are more of an excuse for a good old song and dance, really. But most musical theatre has moved so far away from this as a model, isn't it time that Panto did the same and upped its levels of musical sophistication? Or would that just kill it? Is it that froth and lightness that we love about Panto? Well, to explore this a bit further, I went to the Theatre Royal in Bury St Edmunds to see this year's Cinderella and the Glass Slipper. The Theatre Royal is an exquisite theatre. It's the only Regency theatre in the country and it's just reopened after being closed for two years to be refurbished as closely as possible to the original theatre. It's always been the home of very traditional pantomime in a very historic and traditional theatre. This year's Cinderella, though, proved to be just a bit different. It's set in Russia, so that's already an unusual move. And all the music is originally written for the show by composer and musical director Anne-Marie Lewis-Thomas. I caught up with Anne-Marie backstage after the show to see what she thought about original music versus pop in the pantomime. 
Can you tell me what you think the difference between panto and musical theatre is? Because this is a, a website for musical theatre lovers. Do you think there is a difference? I don't think there should be a difference. I think there is a difference. Right. I think at the moment, the most pantos just insert pop music. Absolutely. And it, it doesn't enhance the story, it doesn't push the story, it just deals, I don't know, with being popular, I suppose, just like the celebrities that they put in them. Absolutely. Now, we should mention that you've composed all the music um, originally for Cinderella at, uh, at Berry Theatre Royal. So do you think the audience now has a preconception that it will be pop songs? I think most definitely. We've had a thing here quite recently mm. where the audience were a little bit perturbed when they found out it was going to be original music. Oh, that's interesting. And a little bit upset by the thought of it. And it's been quite interesting to see them come round. I mean, it, it was written with that in mind, so the music is familiar and it's, it's not particularly clever, and it, it's easily accessible. It's a lot more, for example, Andrew Webber than Stephen Sondheim. Yeah. Um, and, and that seems to have worked, because people enjoy the fact that they feel like they know it, um, in, in a positive way, not, not in a negative way, and that everybody that originally said that they hated the thought of it being original music mm. have not, has now come round. What I noticed... Um most was there's some large sort of ballad numbers that really drive the plot forward. And, um, and that's probably one of the major differences, isn't it? That, that the music actually does spur on the action and things actually happen within a song rather than yeah, having an entertaining because movement. Because normally, because the pop songs have nothing to do with the plot whatsoever, they're, they're always shortened as well because of that reason, because they can't yeah. move anything forward. Whereas now, the music, just like in the music, in the musical, can enhance the story and add to it and go a little bit deeper without you know, becoming terribly dark about it and mm. still keeping it quite light. But, I, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, it's a real shame that everybody isn't putting original music in. Yeah, absolutely. And I would have to say this is probably the first panto I've seen where I had those same sort of spine-tingling moments that you get in a normal musical that I've never had in a panto before, sort oh, of where all the good. layers come yeah, in. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it's a very difficult line, and we were aware when we were writing it that we might sort of do that and we did keep saying oh god we've written a musical but it's not it's most definitely a panto but as you quite rightly said in the ballad it becomes very musical theatre but I think a, a pantomime is musical theatre if you what's the definition of a musical panto would, would come under it wouldn't it because it, it, it's, a, it's a play that's enhanced by music and one of the other major differences with normal pantos is that um, you have a male as the prince yes which so that makes it much more real and you really do sort of track his journey through in this version of Cinderella rather than you know here's a girl in, in boots who, who just needs to stand there yeah, and I think musically as well, it, it makes it easier to write that kind of love song, mm. I think. I, I'm sure other traditionists would disagree with that, but for me personally, I preferred writing it for the, the genders that we ended up choosing. Yeah, absolutely. And did you have a particular audience in mind? Did you think, um, were you going for the children or for mixed family audience? or Very both? mixed. And the, the Theatre Royal has got a very strong audience base. And they really believe in their panto and they really believe in their theatre. In fact, of all the theatres I've worked at, this one, more than any other, seems to have this ownership within the, the town. Mm. Um, and up until, for the last two years, it's been in a big top, their theatre here, because the theatre royal has been under renovation. That's right. So the, the, there's great expectations, I think, this year, which, whilst I wasn't involved in the last year, I was very much made aware that the expectation was to make it something very different. Mm. And interestingly, and, and good news for composers everywhere I, I suspect that their way of making it different and spectacular this year was to do some original music. Did anything change structurally um, with, along those same lines? You had a very big sort of opening kind of prologue like chorus rather than the traditional sort of baddie comes on opening. It was very much because this version of Cinderella is bizarrely set in Russia. Absolutely. The whole opening was literally to slam the audience's face in the Russian bit of it. Yeah. And that, that was the, the absolute object of it. Hence the reason it's called Dobra Den at the beginning. And they just keep singing as many Russian rhymes as I can fit in. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and what about the traditional sing-along song? Did, was, that, um, was that more tricky because it was original and, and not something that they, they no, would be familiar that, with? That, that was tricky because, in all honesty, I forgot to write it. <laughs> and, and we had a lunchtime to write it. 
and that's all I did was get together with my choreographer and work out what sort of things people could do in their chairs that were safe. So it sort of came from the actions. Absolutely. Really. And yeah. because there's a sort of a, the Russian theme that goes through a lot of the, the music. Little bits it. of fiddler yeah, on the roof. Absolutely. Of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of die, 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 dies. I've yeah. been Welsh myself, that sort of appealed to me. So, <laughs> so the sing along kind of sorted itself out by the end with a few dies thrown in. Yeah. But no, that, in all honesty, that was a lunchtime job of forgetting to have written the song. So do you think, just to sum up, it would be. It would be much more preferable for Panto generally to take this turn of having original music. I think if people like First Family and Kudos decided to start hiring people to write music, that would just change the musical theatre in this country. Just because, as we all know, nobody can afford to put, to put their money into musicals, mm. or they're afraid to put money into musicals. And Panto's are such a surefire hit, I don't think they'd lose the revenue... And it'd be so exciting for all of us that enjoy musical theatre, because I'm sure loads of composers and lyricists around the country would be delighted to be writing for Christmas. Absolutely. And, uh, and, you know, it stops people being scared of new music. Mm. Yeah, so you could carry on through the rest of the year, they then feel that they can approach... Yeah, absolutely. And, and, yeah, and being unfamiliar is safe, and that's exciting. And I I suspect it won't happen, but it's good that somewhere like the Field of Old in Edmonds has taken that risk... And, you know, especially as it was a very big risk for them. And they, we were all made aware of that very, very early on. Well, thank you very much for talking to us. We should uh, let you get on with your next show. As thank you, can you very hear. much. Preparations are going on. Thank you. Well, based on Berry St Edmund's version of Cinderella, I would have to say that original music in Panto gets my vote every time. All the elements of Panto were still there. There was still as much direct address to the audience as usual, and you didn't feel at all that they'd overcrossed the line between Panto and musical. But it was so much more engaging, using music which was crafted to actually belong in the world of the show, and to forward the action and the character development, you really did get much more involved in the show. Will the rest of the world agree with me? Well, we will just have to wait and see. It's time to say goodbye from the Barbican. Did I mention we're in the Barbican? We're in the Barbican. Are we in the Barbican, Thoth? We are. It's the gateway to pantomime. It certainly is. And that's all from Musical Talk. This week, you can check out our forums, www.musicaltalk.co.uk. If you go to that site, you'll also see the numbers that you can ring us on. If you disagree with us, if you want to infuse about the show, if you want to tell us it's terrible, please do via our forums and please do via our talk lines. And if you want to send us reviews of any pantos that you have seen, whether here or in Australia, where I gather they have them, or in America, where I... They probably don't, frankly, then please do so. And if you don't comment, I will grind your bones to make my bread. And essentially, that's it. <laughs> and here are some musical out talks. We're going to hear now from Adele Anderson, not only a cabaret ordin- ordinist, our extraordinary artist. <laughs> that's easy for you to spray. <laughs> they cut to the actor in real life who's just shot himself. <laughs> he. Every year on the, the impresarios, all of us. No, that does. doesn't work at all, does it? No. Um, oh no, it doesn't. <laughs> this has been a production of Musical Talk. Copyright two thousand and eight.